All right, hello everyone and welcome to another video with me. I'm Coach Sierra. I'm here with Academic Coaching for World Changers. And today we're going to talk about how to apply the knowledge you have gained about the normal bell curve and the normal distribution slash the 689599 rule slash talking about positively, positively skewed and negatively skewed distributions. I've made a couple other videos talking about the measures of central tendency, the mean, median, and mode, positively skewed versus negatively skewed distributions, as, as well as the normal bell curve slash the normal distribution and how it ties in with the 689599 rule. But I haven't really given you all the opportunity to walk through a question with me, so I wanted to take the time to see how this applies. Now I'm using the Dr. Pam method. The Dr. Pam method is when you don't just look for the right answer, but you need to take the time to understand why it is not the other answer choices and where in the question led you to this answer. So this video is a review of the Dr. Pam method with the research and assessment content. So let's go to question 101. I'm here out of the Helwig book. Which of the following statements about a negatively skewed distribution is accurate? So my first note is, okay, we're talking about a negatively skewed distribution. I know the other types of distributions are the normal bell curve or the normal distribution as well as a positively skewed distribution. If you know your information well, you know that skewed means that the mean, median, and mode do not line up. The mean, median, and the mode only line up in a normal bell curve or a normal distribution. So you would instantly knock out B and D. Dr. Pam says, you know, you are progressing in the content if you're successfully able to knock out two answer choices. Then you're really torn between the last two. And this is where studying really would need to kick in. So, okay, great. We've knocked out two. Is the mean lower than the median and mode or is the mean higher than the median and mode? Well, remember, when we're talking about skewed distributions, we always care about where the mean is. So if the mean is to the left, it's a negatively skewed distribution. If the mean is to the right, it's a positively skewed distribution. But this question isn't asking us left or right. This question is asking us about lower or higher. So I want to remind you that if a value, if the number is closer to the left, that means that's lower in value than when a number is to the right. This is how numbers work in US English math. For example, because it's Christmas time, if you were cooking your famous baked chicken for Christmas and you said, Coach Sierra, how much do you love my baked chicken on a scale of one to 10? Notice when we write out one to 10, one is on the left and 10 is on the right. If I were to say, how brave are you on a scale of one to 100? about jumping off a cliff or something like that. Notice that the lower numbers are on the left and the higher numbers are on the right. So in a negatively skewed distribution, if you are aware that the mean is on the left, but still not sure how to answer this question, remember numbers on the left are lower in value than numbers on the right. And because we know for a negatively skewed it's on the left, we know that it's lower than the median and mode. Now, if the question was talking about a positively skewed distribution, we would then choose A, that the mean is higher. But the question's not asking us that. So we know that we wouldn't pick A and the answer would be C. Okay, so we just covered the negatively skewed and positively skewed and we went through the answer choices. Also note that B and D alone aren't full answers. For normal bell curve or normal distribution, the mean, median, and mode are equal. So by virtue of also knowing that, I would knock out B and D anyways, because those don't fully stand on their own. I guess you could say that they're true statements because the median and mode are equal, but to fully describe a bell curve, the mean, median, and mode are all equal. All right, let's keep going. I'm going to stop share so I can pull up another question and then I'll bring it back. All right, I'm going to bring us to question 104 in the assessment section of the Helwig book. Because I'm working out of a PDF, my page numbers are not the same as your page numbers, so I'm refraining from giving page numbers, but in the, in the assessment section of the Helwig book 104. For my page, it's 330, uh, but some versions are different, so you might see it on 337, or you might see it on 2 or 3, 
28, a couple of pages before, a couple of pages ahead. So 104, which of the following is least representative of what standardized scores are? So then you need to think, okay, what are standardized scores? Standardized scores are on the normal bell curve or normal distribution. The scores are also known as Z scores and T scores. We've covered that before in a video. Least representative. I don't see anything about Z scores and T scores or the normal bell curve. Well, this is where we have to remember that standardized scores are derived scores. They are derived from raw scores. Raw scores are the original form of data. They are not comparable. We use the example of for the NCE, how each state has a different passing rate. So if Susie were to get a 95, that 95 is really hard to decipher when one state has a passing rate of 98 and another state has a passing rate of 94. This might be great if we're looking within each state because we could conclude an answer. But if I'm looking at a national scale, this 95 then becomes a raw score because it's not quite comparable because I have different denominators or bottom numbers. It's like in math class, you can't add one half plus one fourth without finding a common denominator, if you all remember that. So to uh, make up for this, we take our raw scores and we standardize them into standard scores. Okay, so with that, we know that standardized scores are transform scores because they're transformed from their raw score state. We also know that standardized scores are common language. What do we mean by that common language? Well, raw scores are only existing once the person has taken their test and the test results are given. That's your score. But then they get standardized. So a lot of researchers and statisticians don't really look at the raw scores. We look at standard scores. And that's why it's considered common language. Now, again, if you're stuck between the two, so you're able to knock out C and D, you would then need to remember, wait, correlations is a term in and of itself, okay? Correlations means relationships, not between partners, but between variables, all right? So correlations is its own term. I use the example in my individual classes that if uh, the normal bell curve and standard scores are a Volkswagen, then a correla correlations is like a Nissan. Like these are same cars. You might see them on the test or they're both cars. You might see them on the same test, but they are different cars. And so you really need to know about the different cars. Correlation means relationships. It's its own wheelhouse. So the right answer is A. Now, if you're still lost here about the common language concept, if I'm using the Hellwig book and type in common language, I'm in a search bar. Of course, you'd have to go through this section if you're in a hard copy. If you look here, standardized score is like a common language that we can use to compare several different test scores for the same individual. For example, a person has a raw score of 60 on a vocabulary test and a raw score of 45 on an arithmetic test. Which performance is better? We cannot tell. Direct comparisons are not possible with raw scores. So we have to convert both of those scores into a standardized score scale or standardized score so that we can realistically compare them. Now, if you've seen another video, my other video on the normal bell curve, this might sound familiar. That standardized scores occur by converting those raw scores into those standard scores. These new derived scores, derived meaning come from raw scores, provide for a constant normative or relative meaning. Now we have some meaning to our scores, allowing for the comparisons. So going back to that normal bell curve video, that the purpose of the normal bell curve is to allow us to make comparisons between individual test scores. Once they've been standardized, of course, we then can use a standard deviation to talk about the distance the score is away from the mean, which is the definition of a standard deviation, the unit we move away from the mean. Okay, let's keep going. I'm now on question 106. In a normal distribution, also known as the normal bell curve, what percentage of scores fall within the range of positive two and negative two standard deviations from the mean? All right, so we have numbers and I can hear people freaking out already. Like, <clears throat> I'm not a math person. I didn't go to school for math. Remember, this is not a math exam. Research and assessment is interpreting numbers, not calculating numbers. Okay, so normal distribution. You should think, what is the rule for the normal distribution? Not the formula, not the equation, but the rule. It's called the 68, 95, 99 rule for a reason. So 
using the Dr. Pam method, I should be able to knock out two answer choices, C and D, because they're not part of the 6895-99 rule. You might be wondering, okay, hold on, if it's the 6895-99 rule, why didn't I knock out A? That's because technically 95 can be rounded up to 96. 95 is technically 95.45. So depending on the type of practice exam that you're taking, you might see 96. Here's an image that I'm sharing to explain this a little further. It's called the 6895-99 rule, yes, but 95 is technically 95.45. So sometimes you might see it rounded up to 96. So now that you know that, you would know to pick A. But you might be thinking, Coach Sierra, okay, you just explained that. If I didn't know that, if I was in the real test, I would not know what to pick, right? Because 68, I know is between negative one and positive one deviations, and 96 is not the rule that I learned. Well, remember, if you know that 68 is between negative one and positive one, it can't be between negative two and positive two. So in my individual classes, I always remind everyone, go with what you know. You know it's a 68-95-99 rule, and you know that 68 has a place with negative one and positive one deviations, or 40 to 64 T-score. So it wouldn't magically become B if you know that it has a place between negative one and positive one. In this case, it would be A because 95 was rounded up to 96. Okay. 107. Z scores and T scores make it possible to compare the results of several different tests taken by one individual. V scores are examples of, we've said this and said it again, D standard scores, but let's move through those, okay? Remember, deviations is the unit we move away from the mean. Standard scores are not standard deviations. I feel like a lot of people get those confused. I am a woman who has glasses, but I am not my glasses. C scores and T scores, which are standard scores, have deviations, but they're not the same thing as saying they are deviations. Okay, so we knock out A. We know that standard scores come from raw scores or derive from raw scores, so it's not B. And we also know that raw scores are not comparable. So when it says make it possible to compare, we know that it's not B because raw scores can't do that. That leaves C. Normal scores. You might think, ah, normal scores. I've never heard of normal scores before. That's because it's not a term. That's because it's not a term. Be very careful when you're in the actual exam, right? And you're looking at an answer choice and you think, Dr. Pam's never talked about this. Coach Joyce never, never talked about this. I've never heard the other coaches talk about this. I've never seen it on a YouTube video. Could it be the answer? No. Standard scores are on the normal bell curve or the normal distribution, but normal scores is not a term that you will see. It's not an official term. Standard scores are on the normal bell curve, normal distribution. But if you hadn't studied, you might be really tempted by C, normal scores, because you know it's on the normal distribution and you know their scores, but the right answer is D, standard scores. All right. Okay, last one, last one. 113, if a test has a mean of 50 and a standard deviation of 10, we know more numbers. Don't freak out. Go with what you know. If you have been studying your normal bell curve, you would know that if a test has a mean of 50 and a standard deviation of 10, we are talking about a T-score because a T-score has a mean of 50 and a standard deviation of 10. You also would know that the only time we talk about a standard deviation is when we're referring to the normal bell curve. So you would know, okay, this is the 68-95-99 rule. We also have just learned that 95 can be rounded up to 96. If you know that rule alone, honestly, you could knock out B, C, and D. But, 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 let's just say it wasn't that easy. And let's go back. Okay, so, well, it's not D because between 50 and 60 is not 50%. All right, between 50 and 60 technically is 34% because 40 and 60 is 68%. So if you divide that in half, it'd be 34, not D. The fact that 34% of the test take, 34% of the test taker scored higher than 60. That's not true. If you know of the normal bell curve, it thins out at the side. So if the thickest section is 34 in the middle, as we move out, those percentages are going to have to be smaller. So it's not C. Some people read this question as, if a test has a mean of 50 and a single standard deviation of 10, we know. 
So then a lot of people are tempted by B, okay? Because they read the question as, well, it says it's one standard deviation away, but the question does not say that. It's just saying, what do we know about when we have a mean of 50 and a standard deviation of 10? A standard deviation of 10 means when we move away from the mean, we move in 10. So if you're tempted by B, let's look at it. Okay, let's say 40 to 60. That is a valid answer. Valid means accurate, by the way, uh, for a T-score. But then look here at the percentage. 40 to 60 is 68%, not 50%. So that knocks out B. That leaves A. We know that 30 to 70 is 95%, also sometimes rounded up to 96 I've used this image in my other video, but I'm gonna pull it up here again for those maybe slightly confused. Here, negative one to positive one is 68, negative two to positive two is 99, negative 95, negative three to positive three is 99, 40 to 60 is 68%, 30 to 70 is 95, sometimes rounded up to 96 as discussed, and 20 to 80 is 99. With that, I hope that it eased some anxiety with seeing numbers on the exam, as well as increased your understanding of the 68, 95, 99 rule, standard scores, standard deviations, raw scores, positively skewed and negatively skewed distributions. And of course, if you have any questions or if you're still confused, one, you can watch other videos on our YouTube channel or email us at drpam2020 at gmail.com and look into our services. I offer individual sessions for research and assessment, as well as we have a bundle, all right? So you can move through the whole section if you're just now studying for the exam. I highly recommend it. A lot of people come to research and assessment at the end before they test. Depending on where you are in your journey, you might be advised differently, but all your questions, go to drpam2020 at gmail.com and they will totally advise you. We have a great team. All right, great to see you. Have a lovely day. Bye-bye.